This is a small excerpt of the entire conduct. Contact Report 437 Translation An important message for the reader of this document. We, Dai and Divine and Vivian Leg of www.guyaguys.net have been given permission by Billy Meyer, www.figu.org, to make these unofficial, preliminary translations of Figu material. Please be advised that our translations may contain errors. Charles Darwin Oh well, I have here yet another question because someone has asked me for an answer in the bulletin regarding on what Charles Darwin, in 1859, has constructed his theory of evolution, that the human is ascended from apes. I learned from your father, Sfath, that Darwin falsified an ape skeleton in order to demonstrate his theory, whereby however his assertion, being that the human descended from apes, did not just grow out of his own rubbish. In reality, as Sfoth explained, Charles Darwin was linked with Tibetan Buddhists, who told him of the Tibetan legend, according to which all humans descend from eight different branches of apes. Can I convey my answer in this way? Naturally, because what my father explained to him corresponds with the truth. Darwin was a human who craved renown and did everything illicitly and dishonestly to greatly build up his image. The Darwinian teaching of evolution in regard to the earth humans, that they originally arose from the apes, is truly not based on his own thought processes or from his own research, rather on a Tibetan legend that all humans descended from eight different branches of apes. Darwin put the legend to use, whereby he suitably filed certain bones of an ape skeleton in order to substantiate and provide a line of evidence for his deceit, and presented the whole thing to the scientific body of the day. Darwin, as founder of the so-called modern theory of evolution, actually did study medicine and then later theology, whereby he came into contact with Buddhists from Tibet. Indeed, he was generally dealt with as a naturalist, but that role started as he took part in the world voyage of the survey ship Beagle, which was underway on the world seas from 1831 until 1836. From 1842, as I have read, he began to work on his comprehensive travel experiences, and systematically collected his extensive material together in regard to the origin of the species. Geological observations as well as those of fauna as it pertains to geography, caused him to doubt the accuracy of the traditional doctrine of the immutability of species. From that also arose his main work, The Origin of the Species Through Natural Selection, which constituted a turning point in the history of biology in 1859. With the theory of selection, which led to Darwinism, respectively to the Darwinian teachings of descent, he explained the purpose of adaptation of forms of life to the environment. That he thereby also tried to underpin his teachings through the fraud of his adaptation of ape bones, and that he presented the Tibetan legend, that all humans are arisen from eight branches of apes, as reality, then led to the erroneous teaching that the human descended from apes, whereby this has endured until today and even the scientists grant their belief to this deception. In 1871 he then published two volumes entitled, The Descent of Man. Darwin was born on February 12, 1809 in the Mount at Shrewsbury in England, and he died on April 19, 1882 in Down House, which corresponds to today's London Bromley. Are these statements true so far? All of it corresponds to that which is correct. The Dalai Lama and Lamaism Note. Lamaism is an alternative term used to distinguish Tibetan Buddhism from other Buddhism. Then yet again a bulletin question which relates to the 13th Dalai Lama. The question is this. Why did the 13th Dalai Lama, Mongolian Dalai equals ocean of learned knowledge, and Tibetan Blama equals a superior, have to flee from the Chinese? The question is somewhat confusing, 
because Quetzal taught me something else. As, however, you also did. Consequently, to my knowledge, it was not the 13th Dalai Lama who fled from the Chinese, rather the 14th, who is actually called Bstan Jinrajim Cho and who was born in 1935 and enthroned in 1940. His current domicile, if I am not mistaken, is Dharamsala, in the constituent state of Himachal Pradesh in India. In 1959 he fled to India as the Chinese occupied Tibet, because the Dalai Lama is, in truth, not a religious head, rather a political head, even if something else is asserted by the Lamaists who say that he is the highest spiritual dignitary. He emerged as the political power holder, in the context of the Tibetan government in exile led by him in order to obtain a real autonomous Tibet through negotiations with the Chinese government, whereby the Dalai Lama is then naturally supposed to constitute the sovereign, respectively, the political ruler. The Tibetan government in exile is not officially acknowledged by any country. Even when the 14th Dalai Lama emerges as the spiritual dignitary of Lamaism and officially stands up in the world for tolerance among the religions and the peoples, as well as for the observation of humanity's global responsibility, in the background, hidden in his deeds, is actually his political power nature which he gladly wants to exercise in Tibet and presumably even in the entire world. With him it is therefore about power, which was already the case with the 13th Dalai Lama, who was the political leader of Tibet and also with the others before him. He chased into flight the Pankin Lama, respectively, Penchen Lama, meaning, learned philosopher, respectively, the spiritual leader and co-regent of Tibet, and indeed in the year 1923. His flight led him to China where a large Buddhist community offered him protection. His life was threatened by the 13th Dalai Lama who had sent out his soldiers to mercilessly immediately shoot the Pankin Lama if they got hold of him. You have also taught me that on one hand, the Lamaist Lhasa, the Lamaist center in Tibet, is, so to speak, a secret world center in Asia and that, Secondly, Lamaism is a degenerated and despotic sect which cannot be equated with Buddhism, although the Dalai Lama and the Lamaists refer to Buddhism in regard to their religion. Accordingly, the national religion of Tibet also cannot be called Buddhism, rather only Lamaism, which has nothing to do with real Buddhism, if nowadays a true Buddhism may be spoken of at all, because, even with this, very many things were distorted and indeed even in regard to the teaching of Gautama Buddha, consequently the real teaching was only taught, understood and lived by the Prophet himself. True Buddhism knows neither force nor power, nor despotism or forms of unfreedom, of discord or of disharmony. Yet what is taught and lived today, also with all other religions and sects, has nothing more or not much more, to do with the actual teachings of the Prophet Buddha, because these were thoroughly distorted. The Dalai Lama, Bstan Jinrajim Cho, who today cruises around in the world, promotes a free Tibet and writes books with an expert content, is no Buddhist at all, rather a Lamaist who strives for state power. Who then still wonders that he had to flee from the Chinese? The fact is that the Tibetan Lamaists committed monstrous atrocities before the Chinese again took over control of Tibet, whereby, at any rate, they are also to blame for unbelievable atrocities. Naturally this truth is vehemently disputed and denied as well as twisted from all sides, as also is the truth that, after the founding of the People's Republic of China, Tibet became the most important bulwark and the forbidden land of the communist countries in order to stop the British Empire which, with evil force, attempted to spread itself out further in Asia. 
The truth is that Tibet's independence was first discussed in 1840 and indeed with the so-called Opium War. At that time the West's invasion of China began, whereby the British attempted to separate Tibet from China. That was also the time in which the Great and Worldwide Espionage Network was built up which had already been constructed under Queen Elizabeth of England in the 17th century and which has been maintained in the most various forms up to the current time. That is, on the whole, that which I have been taught by you people. You have held everything in your memory well. In spite of these facts, most Western countries revere the Dalai Lama in particular, as also, however, do the Tibetan Lamaists, whereby neither these believers nor the Western worshippers and followers know the actual facts about the Dalai Lama and Lamaism. The believers of Lamaism are so duped that they follow the Dalai Lama blindly and neither examine the background of this nor the background of the machinations of Lamaism. There are only few real experts in the entire matter about the Dalai Lama and Lamaism, as, for example, diverse journalists who also name the facts openly, as, for example, in 2000, when the German media openly challenged the Dalai Lama and talked plainly. So, for example, the following points were openly held against him, which he naturally vehemently denied. 1. That he defames his critics, respectively, slanders them, and brings them into disrepute. 2. That he actively oppresses religious minorities, however, otherwise plays the good human. 3. That he has knowingly falsified the history of Tibet in his flight, and so forth. 4. That he perfidiously exploits his political status and his power as head of the Lamaists over the believers. 5. That he oppresses any political and religious opposition to himself. 6. That he has fallen into to a most extreme tyrannical and undemocratic leadership style. 7. That he maintains rituals which are misogynistic, respectively antagonistic to women. 8. That he maintained, and maintains, friendship-based contacts with former SS members, respectively, Nazi bigwigs, as well as with neo-Nazis. What there is further to say relates to the USA, which indeed cannot possibly be any other way at all whose Secret Service CIA plays a decisive role in the more recent history of Tibet, as Quetzal once said. The CIA, according to his statement, was the authoritative factor behind the success of the Dalai Lama's flight to India, where he lived in exile and was supported by the U.S. Secret Service as well as the guerrilla army, respectively, the armed Tibetan Lamaist troops who caused much harm and perpetrated monstrous atrocities, however, in reality, could not accomplish much to bring Tibet under their and the Dalai Lama's control. Nevertheless, however, the acts of the guerrilla army had a great significance for the moral of the community of Tibetan exiles who fled to various countries, because they hoped that a return to a free Tibet would be possible for them, whereby, however, they only knew the propaganda of the Dalai Lama, which is always still the case, while the truth is withheld from them. And that the CIA in Tibet also forcefully functioned in another way, was also clearly connected, among other things, with the occurrences of uranium which the country had to offer and which was not supposed to fall into the hands of the Russians. However, in regard to Tibet, other powers also played their notes, as, for example, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky 1831-1891, who spread the nonsense of the ascended Tibetan masters in the West, allegedly transmitted for the first time in 1870 which firstly and lastly has influenced the entire New Age movement, which directly, with its criticism of culture and community, 
initially came about in the Californian counterculture of the 1960s. The term New Age is however much older than the current trends and leads back into the 19th century, and indeed to occult and esoteric worldviews, which, as said, were also influenced by Helena Blavatsky. Influenced by that were indeed also the National Socialistic Nazi Rudolf Hess and Subotendorf, who, together in 1918, respectively, 1919, in Munich, founded the Secret Thal Society, a large type association which was constructed on the principles of Lamaist teaching. This alliance functioned as an umbrella organization for old German, fatherland-oriented and ethnicity-oriented societies of Munich. The alliance pushed predominantly anti-Semitic propaganda, whereby the crowning joke of the matter is that from out of these assimilated ideologies, which were popular at the time, the founding of the United Nations came forth in the year 1945. The entire thing came forth out of the 1912-founded German Thule sect which was connected with the 1910-founded Hammer Alliance and with the Radical People's Old German Association. Their symbols were the swastika, respectively, the hook cross and the Germanic runes. The association had its own newspaper, the Municher Observer. The Thal Society was comprised of 1,500 members who had connections with broad sectors of Bavarian society. Along with Rudolf Hess and Subotendorf, many other national socialists also belonged to the Thal Society, who also contributed to the development of subversive plans and promoted counter-revolutionary groups, as for example, the German Workers' Party and the NSDAP Nazi Party, Bynum of National Socialist German Workers' Party, German National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiter Partei NSDAP, which had come out of it. Then, in 1919, the Thal Society organized a militant fighting union which decisively took part in the free court to strike down the Bavarian Council Republic. That, my friend, correlates to that which I still know in regard to the history, whereby, however, I have still read up somewhat to freshen my memory. What you say corresponds to reality. Climate change is caused by overpopulation. Still something because of the weather. Winter is keeping us waiting, as you said at our last meeting as however also that the climate change is ever more rapid. Can you still briefly say something about that? The climate warms ever faster, whereby the snowfall is also absent ever more frequently in the deeper sites, while the Earth's polar ice masses, as well as the glaciers, melt ever faster, which leads to this, that by the year 2100, in some cases, the water of the seas will rise up to 160 centimeters, 5 foot 3 inches. Forceful natural changes have become unstoppable, consequently there is also a general change in the world of animals, birds, fish and the entirety of the fauna, as however also regarding the flora, because already it is all changing and is beginning to adapt to the new conditions of nature. Thus, it is also the case with the migratory birds which remain in their home areas in winter and are no longer drawn to other domains. It is the same with migratory animals, because their pasture relands are changing and everything is taking on new forms. And the origin of everything is overpopulation, which, however, neither humanity nor the responsible scientists, authorities and governments want to accept as true. The more humans there are, the bigger become the entire environmental problems of interpersonal relationships, humans living together, illnesses, epidemics and criminality as well as wrongdoing and wars, and so forth. And what is resolved, and eventually implemented, regarding climate protection and so forth, ends in a farce because the responsible ones are so stupid that they cannot think into the future. Consequently, 
they do not see that their resolved and perhaps implemented measures are only a drop of water on an ever increasingly hot stone. That is therefore so, because, in the time in which the measures eventually become realized, Earth's population increases by hundreds of millions again, and thereby naturally also all the problems, whereby the implemented measures to protect the environment already become worthless before they have even only begun. All the responsible ones are too stupid and narrow-minded to recognize that help in regard to the protection of the environment can thereby only be provided when the resolved measures, or the measures yet to be resolved, for the protection of the environment and the protection of the climate, and so forth, are only useful in association with the regulation for a global halt to births. But as long as this is not recognized and is not implemented, so climb the problems of the destruction of the environment, energy problems, illnesses, epidemics, criminality, wrongdoing, wars and family dramas, absent interpersonal relationships, race hate, xenophobia, hate between and among humans and religious hatred and so forth. In the same way, the general softening of the human also increases in regard to the quality of life and the alacrity regarding a willingness to work on anything worthwhile and lasting. But overpopulation also brings with it, that the human's entire body suffers ever more from damage to its health, because it is ever more susceptible to it, and also, in regard to the body's resilience to the ailments, suffering from illnesses and diseases. The human is becoming ever softer, less capable and vulnerable, which often ends in cowardly suicide. The quality of the affirmation of life sinks just as rapidly as also does the respect for life generally. But the effects of overpopulation are also demonstrated by humans becoming ever more uneducated, and becoming addicted to evil vices, habits and degenerations whereby the most common forms are especially alcohol, drugs, and excessive seeking of pleasure and craving for travel, as well as degenerated sexual cravings. Parents ever more commonly leave their children undefended, allow them to starve and die of thirst, beat them to death, force them into prostitution or sell them, while in other families, conflict and strife, as well as battery and jealousy, rule between the marriage partners, which night seldom leads to the dissolution of the entire family through murder and homicide. And still, ever more, only hate, profit craving, strife, disharmony, bondage, vice, addiction, revenge and the like rule among the individual humans, among the peoples and even the entirety of humanity because only few honestly concern themselves with love, peace, freedom, harmony and a valuable living together for good interpersonal relationships in a creationally correct manner of living as well as for a good and deliberate evolution of the consciousness. Out of that, it also results that for the majority of humankind, true love and friendship are only empty and worthless words. And yet only isolated humans are lovingly concerned about the well-being of their neighbor. And what do the responsible ones of the governments do against all this evil? Nothing! They only thirst after their high and far overloaded stipends, however, undertake nothing valuable in order to discern the true facts of all the evil and to undertake anything truly effective to stop all the need and all the misery of humanity as well as of nature the environment the climate and the planet they crank out only hollow and empty words let their own life be a good one and don't concern themselves even so much as a pinch of filth about all the countless problems and if, for once a true human comes into a government, who works in the sense of truth and reality for the people in the homeland, as for example, in Switzerland, the upper house member Christoph Blocker, who can be called the only truthful member and represents the interests of the righteous, thinking and intelligent ones, 
as well as the interests of the country and thereby the homeland, who really recognizes the real problems and wants to change them to the better, then, in their own ranks, as well as among the people and in the parties, all the inexpert, incapable and weak-witted ones step into the plan and, with abuse and insults and opprobrium, shout down the ones who are industriously concerned with the good and best changes. And, as a rule, they do it, therefore, because they, on one hand, exercise their power and do not want what is right and good, and, on the other hand, because their intelligence does not reach far enough to recognize the effective truth, and, in regard to this, to do that which is correct and valuable. Therein the evil also takes root such that those who govern are not capable of teaching the people through appropriate schooling as regards the creational and natural laws, so that the humans slowly but surely turn to the effective life and effective way of living, and thereby also true love, freedom, harmony, and true peace as well as true humanity. Facts that are already often named in our conversations, and which you have carried out into the world, which up until now, however, have, by and large, borne no fruit. Pleiadian Plagiarian Contact Reports Conversations, Volume 11. Pages 52 and 53, 437th Contact, Saturday, November the 18th, 2006, 9.57 a.m. Continued. Then something else. I was discussing the big quake in California with Quetzal, that is to say, San Francisco, which is already overdue. Have any new things come about there, or does everything remain as Quetzal told me? That the earthquake is to be expected in the foreseeable future and that it will be the biggest natural disaster in living memory? The quake will not just have a negative impact upon San Francisco, but also Los Angeles, San Diego and various other places. And as Quetzal said, Possibly the seaward part of the San Andreas Fault will tear off, whereby an elongated island would result. You have seen the enormous destruction in the future, however, only in relation to the Earth's site. But the entirety will, however, be much worse when the Great Quake occurs. The point in time has remained the same as that which Quetzal named for you. Therefore, Everything remains as predicted and as it was, as I have seen then through the travel into the future. It was, at that time, a journey into the real time of the future of the real event. Consequently also nothing about it can change. Naturally. How stupid of me.